you can actually use the moon as a, almost like a pit stop to Mars. You're listening to The Cosmic Cast. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Cosmic Cast, brought to you by the Earth and Solar System team at the University of Manchester. This week we have the usual hosts, me, Marissa Lowe, Tom Harvey, Hello. Elliot Carter, Hello. and Ricky Bahir. Hello. And our guest this week is Hannah Sargent from the Open University. Hi Hannah, thanks for joining us. Hope you're doing well. How's that going at the Open University? Um, well, I'm sure things at the Open University are doing grand. Here in my office, things are swell too. Uh, <laughs> yep, yeah, so just cracking on with working from home. I'm um, quite lucky that I have a space to do that, actually. So it's not been too bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I suppose for the past few months, you've actually just been writing up the thesis. So how has that been doing that in lockdown? Um, if, uh, yeah, so I think if I ever needed motivation to get on with my thesis, lockdown was probably it because I really had no distractions. Um, but you do miss that kind of the day-to-day -day support if you ever need it and the motivation um, talking to other people is, is really nice. So it, it was a bit challenging trying to do that on your own. Um, but thankfully we've kind of got into a bit of a flow now with those who have been submitting and doing their Viva um, to make it still feel like it's special and you know your hard work is, um, is still worth celebrating even if remotely. Mm. Yeah, and uh, sorry to mention this if it is too soon, but congratulations for passing your Viva a couple of weeks ago. Um, how does it feel to have finished that? Uh, it, do you know what? It, it does feel good, but you know you've still got corrections to go and it just feels like this process just never ends. So <laughs> once I've got that certificate in my hand, I'll feel like I might then believe that it's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I feel that with um, just everything you do for a PhD, it's, you know, you hand in the first draft of something and then you got to go back through it. And yeah. Um, anyway, so you are a lunar scientist. Um, more specifically, you look at um, in situ resource utilization, um, I think was the main topic of your PhD. So, um, yeah, would you mind giving us a bit of background as to what your project was about and what in situ resource utilization is? Yeah, so... Um, in situ resource utilization, otherwise known as ISRU, so I might just use that from, from now on, um, is the idea of using resources um, from the environment, from the local environment around you. So instead of having to bring everything with you from Earth, which is really expensive because it's so heavy and you have to launch it from, from Earth, which has a lot of gravity, um, it's kind of a way of um, trying to make it more economical if you want to have more long term space exploration so longer missions to the lunar surface that sort of permanent habitation and then also um, using resources uh, to launch say from the moon to mars so it's not just living on the moon it's finding the resources there because the moon has lower gravity um, than here on earth it's a lot cheaper to launch things from the lunar surface so if you can make your rocket fuel and your supplies there then you can actually use the moon as a, almost like a pit stop to mars um, so Based off of that, um, the big challenge that most uh, that most sort of ISRU researchers are looking at, at the moment is trying to find or make water on the moon, um, because water is well critical for um, keeping crew alive, uh, your crews alive. Um, it can also be used for radiation protection on the surface of the moon, um, but also again you can split it as to your hydrogen and oxygen, which is your rocket propellant. Um, so it's extremely useful. And there's evidence that there's perhaps frozen water in the polar regions of the moon. Um, so there are a number of missions going to try and search for that frozen water ice, see if we can drill down, see, um, uh, see how distributed it is, because we've never been there before, because it's in really challenging areas to access. Um, and then there's also um, teams looking at how to make water from the rocks themselves. So using chemical reactions, because there's a lot of oxygen bound up in the, the minerals of the moon, like 40 odd percent oxygen. Um, so if we can extract that oxygen and bind it with our hydrogen, we have water or we can just use the oxygen for propellant because that's the kind of the heavier side of the water anyway. Um, so I was kind of somewhere in between the two. So I was working on an instrument called Prosper and that was, uh, well, it's going to be on the Luna 27 mission. So it's a Roscosmos lander. 
um, but there's like a, a European payload that's going um, that's going on board, and Prosper is like this miniature lab, and it's going to be sampling um, some water ice, hopefully. So we're going to drill down next to the lander, see if we can detect some water ice. And I was basically given um, that system and asked, what else can we do with this? What other ISRU experiments could we perhaps do? Because we've never done ISRU on the moon. We've talked about it for decades. We've tested um, uh, different hardware on Earth, but nothing has ever flown in space yet. Um, so after looking at different types of reactions that we could do, um, I found one that would be feasible perhaps with the instrument because it's a really simple setup. I have a furnace, I have um, something called a cold finger, which is uh, just basically something that's really cold. So volatiles of like gases of water and so on could, could condense there. Um, and we had some hydrogen on board as like a reference gas so that we, um, when we detect water, we'll have other gases on board to kind of um, reset the system and make sure it's detecting the right things at the right places. Um, so using um, hydrogen reduction, you can literally heat up your sample, add some hydrogen, the oxygen will bound, uh, bind to it, and that water will then um, stick to the cold finger. And that's basically what I was uh, developing. So it is a technique that's been done before, but in like industrial systems or they've been um, optimized, um, but, and then they're quite complex reactors. So I was trying to see, can we just strip it down to its bare bones to use it in this simple little system? Um, and basically it worked. And I was really lucky enough to use, um, in the end, Apollo samples, which was really exciting to get my hands on those. So I made water from a couple of samples, uh, including one from Apollo 11, which was really awesome. Um, so now hopefully this experiment will be trialed on the mission in a few years time. And that was kind of the result of my, my thesis. So, so prior to doing the Apollo samples, uh, I assume you didn't just jump straight in the deep end and use Apollo samples. Uh, did you did you make some simulant regoliths or something like that prior to it? And then, then you, yeah, as I said, jumped in the deep end with Apollo afterwards. Yeah, the Apollo samples were pretty much like the last month yeah. of my experimental work. Um, There's definitely a lot of boxes I needed to tick first. So the, the mineral that we, that is, um, uh, really good at reducing to give us this water is ilmenite so it's a it's an iron titanium oxide um, and it's 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 really uh, quite common in in the darker areas of the moon and the mare regions um, not so much in the highlands um, which are like the older areas of the moon but um, because it was ilmenite that's going to be reacted that that will be giving us this water I started off with just pure ilmenite so this is just ilmenite from earth um, just to test and like optimize like the conditions that I wanted to use, like the temperatures and, and the pressures of gases I was working with. And then I moved on to a lunar simulant, um, which has been used with lots of different teams around the world. Um, and then I also um, had access to a lunar meteorite, um, just to kind of, the thinking was, well, it's actual lunar material, but not quite as precious as Apollo soils. But um, one of the critical parts of the reaction is that um, you're working with granular material and the grain size is really important. So trying to crush a meteorite to get the same consistency as lunar soil was kind of nigh on impossible. Um, I mean, it kind of worked, it wasn't great, wouldn't recommend it, but it, it kind of was, it was kind of like, well, we, we sort of did it with all that other stuff and it was fine. So. Okay, let's move on to the Apollo. So, so Hannah, can I just say for the audience, Hannah's just saying she doesn't recommend you guys get your lunar meteorites <laughs> and cry and crush them down to a regular Earth size. That's right, right. Yeah, yeah let's, <laughs> I, don't, I wouldn't recommend it for any reason whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is there some kind of um, quantification for how much water you expect to get for a certain amount of ilmenites then? Or, oh no! no were you just kind of like testing? Were you were you essentially just testing whether it's possible or not? Um, so I was testing whether it was possible or not. It was, and also kind of what the lower limits were. So mm. how, what pressure? If I was only going to make the like a, the, the worst case scenario amount of water, um, what pressure was would our detector need to record to mm. say, oh yeah, this has worked successfully? 
um, it's kind of because it's not optimized to produce all of the water that we could possibly ever need. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. just a proof of principle. But we were making maybe um, at like one weight percent. So if you had a kilo of ilmenite, sorry, a kilo of lunar soil, we would get um, uh, 10 grams, if I <laughs> could do maths, 10 grams of water. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's a reasonable amount, yeah, but yeah. we're working with tiny samples like a few like tens of milligrams um but the principle still stands yeah and what is the effect of this process on the sample so what, what do you have left after you've taken all the oxygen from it yeah so the rest of the regolith is uh, so the regolith being like the, the surface the, the soil this upper layer of the moon um what's left most of the minerals are left completely unaffected. Some of them reduce a little bit. So in some of like the pyroxenes or the olivines, which are other sort of iron oxide bearing minerals, um, some of them will reduce a little bit. So they might have, so what's left behind is, is basically pure iron because it's the oxygen that's been removed from the iron oxide. So that's what we were looking for as well in some of our um, imagery that we were taking after the reaction was looking for these like pure iron, like blebs in our imagery. And then in any of the ilmenite grains, it's literally just pure iron and titanium dioxide, which are just really good indicators for us. Um, so hypothetically, like later down the line in terms of um, ISRU, so using these resources on the moon, it's not just oxygen and water that are crucial. We'd want, we would want iron for building and um, an infrastructure uh, and build, making tools and so on. So these would also be usable materials. And also the regolith itself, it, it wouldn't necessarily be waste. Um, you can always use regolith to 3D print a, a wall, a brick, a, a base. Um, so all of these different things are resources that could be used. There's not necessarily waste in these. Are the people like looking at how you actually scale this up? Like, do you have an idea of how, like, where do you get all the hydrogen from that you need to do this on the moon? Yeah, so um, the good thing is hydrogen is really light. So if you are going to have to launch something from Earth, bring in hydrogen is not that bad because you can bring quite a lot okay. um, because it is the lightest element. Um, but there are so many different ways of, of doing this. So there are teams that in the past have, have designed like large reactors that can generate, you know, a thousand tons of oxygen uh, in terms of water um, per year. So they're talking massive scales here um, to support the kind of the needs that of the crew or of or of um, uh, rocket launches and so on. Um, but then there are actually other techniques that you can use, um, like there's, a, there's one being investigated at ESA at the minute, the European Space Agency, looking at um, molten salt electrolysis, I believe. Um, and they can extract the oxygen from all the minerals. So that's lit so instead of having 1%, you can get 40% weight extracted, which is like really, really, amazing but then you have to deal with other issues that come with that process um so that way you can have perhaps um less infrastructure because you, you don't have to deal with as much regolith because you you're just a lot more efficient in your process uh so you mentioned before that the uh, luna 27 mission is aiming to go to the south pole of the moon um, what, why is it going there? And um, are there many areas on the moon that would be suitable for it to go to? Yeah, so the South Pole um, and the North Pole as well, but not as much, um, have these, um, these craters that are in permanent shadow. So it, it just means that they never see sunlight. And so they have the coldest temperatures experienced really kind of in, almost in the solar system down to like 30 Kelvin, I think. Um, and because of this, it means that uh, volatiles such as water can actually stick there. So generally, the moon, there's no atmosphere. So if you have water, it's just instantly going to vaporize. But if, if, if a meteorite or, or something strikes the surface of the moon, bringing with it some water, um, if some of those water molecules just happen to exist near to these um, shadow craters, they'll stick there. And that's why these permanently shadowed regions are thought of as these sources of, um, of water ice deposits. Um, and we do have a lot of evidence for that. There's a lot of remote sensing um, in 
using various different techniques that suggest that there's water there. Um, but the problem is they're in permanent shadow. And so that means it's really dark and it's really cold, not really conditions for sending a rover or a lander. Um, so Luna 27 is going to try and land sort of really near to a shadowed region. So kind of like one side is facing the sun and the other side is facing the shadow. Um, or, or even if it's just close enough that beneath the surface, there might be these layers of, of um, frozen water, even if not necessarily at the surface. Um, so that's why we're heading to the poles. Uh, I forgot what the next part of your question was. <laughs> um, I was just thinking, you know, how, how many areas on the moon are in permanent shadow? Is it just at the poles or are there pockets and other places? Yeah, so the, the bigger ones, if in terms of um, harvesting usable quantities of water, you'd want to head to one of these big craters um, with these big shadowed regions. But there are actually like these micro cold traps all over the moon, if it just so happens. Um, so I'm sure even in like lava tubes, so like these these cave systems that happen to have formed on the moon, um, they could perhaps as well never see sunlight in millions of years and act as these cold traps, which would be really interesting to explore. So yeah, is the importance of these uh, ice deposits then that it, yeah, it's readily available to use water essentially? Because obviously you, you've designed a technique that you can use to get water out regularly, but you may initially need some kind of readily usable water as well. Yeah, it's kind of, um, I don't think we quite agree or know yet, which is the most, um, which is the best source of water. Mm. Because, because we don't know how much there is at the poles or um, how it's distributed. Um, so, and also uh, it might be easier to get it out, just, you know, heat it up, for example, heat up the water ice, um, but accessing those regions is really hard. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, sort of making water from the regular, um, yes, you can do it in a lot of different regions. They're easily accessible, but they're usually really energy intensive. Um, so it's kind of a trade-off. So we, it might depend on, on what we need. If we, if we need our crews to explore the poles for other scientific reasons, then it might be useful to, to use water extraction techniques in the polar regions. But if we want to do more exploring in the equatorial regions, then it, we have like these other options. It doesn't mean that there is one right answer at any one time. You were saying that like, so the stuff you tried out with this uh, Prosper instrument was actually going to get used on the mission. Does that mean that you're now like you have a continued involvement with the mission? Like, what does that look like? I'm definitely trying to stay involved. Um, so the so Prosper is part is part of Prospect, which is the 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 whole European payload. So Prosper is the is the lab, and Proceed is the drill. So Prospect is the totality of the two. Um, so I'm I'm on the Prospect science team. Um, along with you know my supervisory team who are involved as well um, and so whenever conversations go towards um, this particular experiment that's when I'm called up and I get to kind of throw in my two cents and um, because I am the only one at this point who's done anything with it um, so I am the expert which is scary because I could say something that is horribly wrong and no one would know um, <laughs> but it's, it's really exciting and you get to learn a lot about um, the process. So at the minute, we're trying to determine um, the priorities of the science experiments, because if if you could land, say, like with Rosetta, you land and then you find out you don't have enough power because of X reasons. Um, so you have 72 hours prioritize. What are you going to do? Um, so they're trying to prioritize the science experiments that we want to do. So um, yes, we want to search for water ice. And let's say the, car the carousel of ovens. So we have like a, a number of ovens that we can use to sample um, the regolith. So let's say the carousel jars. So we only get one sample. What do we want to do with that one sample? So it's really interesting having those discussions and deciding, um, yeah, what's the most important? What order will we do things and, and why? Um, so you mentioned the drill um, that's part of Prospect. I think that's, is that Proceed? I'm trying to remember yes. all these acronyms now. Um, yeah. how, far, how far down does that drill and what different things can we tell from the different depths? Um, I believe it's a, a metre, but I could be wrong and I could be shot for that. Um, so I, th I think, we so we do want to look at distribution um, and I think, like uh, 
in terms of distance between sampling points won't necessarily be as important as um, sampling at depth. So that's one of our priorities is, um, yeah, I think it'd be more important to stick to one site at first and see how that distribution changes with depth um, because that will tell us a lot. Um, but then it'd be interesting if, if, you, if we were to sample 50 centimeters away and then sampled with depth, is it exactly the same or it could be really different? We don't know. And that is really interesting because that will tell us a lot as well. Um, so these are questions that we're trying to answer because this is something that we just have no idea. Um, this is the remote sensing on that scale. We just can't tell. Remote, remote sensing can give you information on the scale of tens of meters usually. Um, so this will be um, a really critical step. You said that it's going to land uh, in a polar region. Um, is there not difficulties with landing in polar regions? Uh, yes, there are difficulties with landing in polar regions. Um, I'm not part of the team looking at the landing site. So I think, I think actually, I think the Russian side have more control over that. I think ESA are contributing um, uh, landing technology in terms of um, like really precision uh, precision landing mm -hmm. so that if if there are you know major obstacles hopefully we can overcome them um, but in terms of the actual location itself where we'll go I don't actually know yet a lot about that because it will determine what are the priorities for because mm -hmm. uh, on the Russian lander they will also have their own Russian payload scientific payload so it depends what their priorities are um, so we get to contribute to that but uh, we don't make we don't make the final decision mm -hmm. on where we'll end up because these uh, these uh, shaded regions would have to have be quite large as well in terms of uh, for listeners that don't know when you when you're actually landing somewhere you've got what you call a landing ellipse so essentially I, I don't know what the landing ellipse size will be but it's not small and it essentially means when you're landing you're not going to land at a specific point you know you're going to get to you might be quite far away from the point you you want to land at so these are uh, these shadows must be quite large so that you you got some leeway on when you're going to land yeah so uh i mean the shadows are going to be in the craters um mm. so i'm hoping that we don't end up in a crater because <laughs> that would be bad but if we can land near to a crater that would be useful so yeah so you have your landing eclip uh, eclipse ellipse uh, as you said which is um usually kilometers mm. wide um which is massive so i i mean this is me just spitballing here because I don't really know but I assume the precision landing technology will have the ability to make smart decisions as it sees um, as it as it's approaching the surface to, to avoid any obstacles along the way um, because if we were to do it from earth in real time um, we would likely have missed the opportunity to divert because of the time delay so we need the smart technology to to make those active decisions very quickly to avoid any any dangers. Um, it might be good to move on to some questions about your journey to where you got to today. Um, you know, I'm conscious of time and we could talk about this all day. I know. Um, but yeah, it'd be great to ask you, how, how did you end up studying instruments and chemical reactions that could take place on the surface of the moon? You know, how, how does someone get to that point? Uh, it was a convoluted journey, I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I was... A technically a physicist so I did my undergraduate in the Uni of Sheffield. Um, I didn't do too great um, for a number of reasons not necessarily academic related um, and then I ended up I mean I always loved uh, outreach and education so I actually then trained and worked as a science and maths teacher and then worked in a school but it ultimately I mean I enjoyed it but it was a source of income for me to pay for my master's that I really wanted to do because um, at the time there was no uh, funding for postgraduate courses so you kind of had to figure a way out uh, around it um, and then I came across this course in Leicester uh, called Space Exploration Systems and it was just something I hadn't seen before a lot of the space courses were, yeah, you were more either sort of uh, geology focused or um, instrument uh, and engineering focused and this one was kind of a mix of, of, of that and with the physics as well and because I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do it was a really great opportunity to kind of see all sides of it. Um, and then we actually did a, a six month group project um, working with students from, uh, from Turin in Italy and Toulouse in France. And we spent two months at each location and then in Leicester 
working on a, a pre-phase A mission to Mars. So it's kind of like the first step when you're designing a mission. Um, and it was just amazing because you got to work on all these different aspects um, of, of, of mission design. Um, and in that, we were introduced to um, in situ resource utilization because it was going to be a mission to Mars with um, you know, a period of time spent on the surface in this return journey. And to do that, you needed to produce your supplies when you got there. Um, and I just thought it was really interesting. And then towards the end of the project, when I was looking at my next steps, um, looking at PhDs, again, it was usually geology focused in terms of planetary science or designing satellite hardware and so on, which I wasn't particularly interested in. And I wasn't qualified as a geologist to do the planetary stuff. Um, but the Open University, no idea it did research, that no idea it did PhDs, stumbled upon it. Um, and I applied to one, I only applied to one PhD course and um, remarkably got onto it somehow. Um, and yeah, and it was basically this, this instrument that they were developing at the OU. And, um, and I wanted to just see what else could be done, um, preferably looking at in-situ resource utilization. And at the time, it was quite a theoretical thing. It had been looked at decades ago um, in the US, um, but in terms of UK science, it was nothing that was ever done before. Um, and in fact, at the start of my PhD, I remember going to the European Lunar Symposium and kind of getting laughed at when you talk about ISRU and all of this. And now it's just exploded during my PhD. Um, now there are entire conferences dedicated to it. We have entire sessions at the European Lunar Symposium now on in-situ resource utilization. Um, and, and so I've definitely kind of been in the right place at the right time. So I've kind of struck gold a little bit. Um, so, uh, and now there's definitely at least four, five, six PhD students in the UK working on some sort of um, ISRU technology or science. Amazing. Um, I'd actually not heard of that master's course at Leicester before. Um, it sounds like a really good mixture. I feel normally, you know, you have those geologists who don't necessarily have as much good knowledge of the engineering side and then the engineers who don't know what we're talking about either. So that sounds a really good in between. I'd not heard of it before. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I would, I would highly rate it. Um, and in fact, I went back to go um, deliver a seminar in Leicester on my work and um, one of the students sort of found it quite interesting this idea of yeah ISRU and so on and they're actually taking over my work they've just started their PhD this week which is quite fun um so there's a we've got a little chain going of uh, a <laughs> of Leicester to the OU yeah um so have you always been interested in space or was it just pure physics to begin with and then you fell into this or mm. um I've always had an interest in space, but I never knew it was an option. I don't know about, about you guys, but um, never, I was never involved in any kind of like space camp or, or things like that that were, or, well, if I did, it was like, oh, this is fun. It wasn't, this is a career path. It, that's what you see on TV and in the movies. And um, like, I went to Florida as a teen. I was very lucky to go and uh, with my family and we saw a space shuttle launch and I was like this is the coolest thing ever but then you're like well those guys are really awesome I'm just going to go home and you know have a normal nine to five like everybody else um, but then I was actually I was looking back because I, I started my undergrad 10 years ago and I got one of those like throwback things on Facebook of like all the images and so on of the horrors of freshers um but on my wall <laughs> was like pictures of space and that was my that was all of my pictures so it turns out I was it was inevitable I guess um <laughs> but I just didn't realize that I was it was actually going to be a career path because and now I just want to tell everyone no no you can't there's so many cool things going on even in the UK um so I just want to sing and dance about it when even when you started your PhD uh, in the in situ research resource utilization, did it not still feel a bit science fiction? Almost like I can't believe this is actually something that I'm doing right now. Oh yeah, absolutely. There are times when I still feel like that. Um, I think it was reassuring um, once once um, there was more work going on and people were kind of um, seeing that this really needs to be done. So. Mm -hmm. There were definitely advocates for it so ESA were talking about it but it wasn't like 
it was kind of laughed at within the scientific community. Those who weren't dedicated to it didn't really see it as worth it. I, I remember laughing at you. Yes, I, I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. <laughs> Most people did. <laughs> and now I'm like, ha-ha, it's real, it's happening. <laughs> Yeah, so I, mean, I, I uh, sorry, I, I dread to ask the question, but um, do you know? Uh, do you have something lined up for for after your PhD then? Uh, yes, yeah, yes. So I'm. Okay. What I handed in in I handed my thesis in in May. Mm -hmm. um, so I I've been working as a postdoc um, with a another team here at the OU. They're working on something called the Love Me Rover. Um, when the first time they said that to me, I was like, "Excuse me." Um, <laughs> Uh, it does stand for something, um, lunar volatiles thing. So it's basically, it's, it does, it's very similar to, to what I've been working on, but it's on a rover rather than a lander. Mm -hmm. um, and it's purely based within um, the European community. Um, so I've been, but I really wanted to expand my skill set. Um, so I've been working on the development of a mass spectrometer. I've been looking at the impacts of um, the dust environment of the moon and um and how that can damage the equipment so trying to protect the rover from that um, so that's been really interesting um uh looking at all those different sides of things because i still don't know where i'll end up so i want to learn as much as i can um but yeah so i'm currently in the process of applying to my next position because this will be until sometime next year um so i'm trying to figure out what i'll do next but i just don't know <laughs> i don't think anyone ever does <laughs> no um, yeah, how has it been working in such a multidisciplinary field? Because obviously, if you started off doing physics and then, you know, brought in a bit more of the engineering and space science into there, and then obviously you're doing experiments, which are probably more chemistry based. And then, you know, you're trying yeah. to explain it to all the geologists. H how is that? And, you know, how do you deal with that? <laughs> um, I do feel a lot of the time like a jack of all trades, master of none. Um, because I have to, I have to know so much to get by. But if I was to dedicate my time to know it thoroughly, and in, in its entirety, then I would never have time to do anything else. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a challenge: trying to get as much knowledge as you need um, without wasting too much time. Um, but I, I think I really enjoy it because I'm I'm someone who gets bored quite easily. So it's important for me to. Um, to, to have lots of different options of, of ways for me to be productive and, and use my time. Um, so I do find it really interesting. Um, and I find I can actually then apply my, it means I can apply my skills to lots of different projects. So I think going forward, it, it kind of, it can open up a few more doors, but then conversely, I guess, if someone wants an expert in something, I'm probably not going to be it because <laughs> I'm probably not an expert in anything. <laughs> I think we probably all feel like that though about what we do. So you know, yeah. we just don't need to tell our boss. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I understand this is probably the height of your presentation career, being on the Cosmic Cast right now. Um, mm -hmm. But I think we should point out to the audience that you've done a TED talk before as well. Uh, I've I've done like. The, the introduction to TED. So I've done TEDx, which is uh, which is the independently organised but technically still like TED approved mm -hmm. TED talks. Um, yeah. So yeah, that was it. Was really it's like oh, it's horrifying if you ever do one. <laughs> it because um, it's like a ten minute. It's a ten minute monologue that you have to get word perfect. Um, whereas like having a conversation or delivering a lecture, it's a bit more of a yeah. It's it's a com it's a conversation and you mess up. You just have a laugh and a joke. But TED talks are like you know spot on and uh i think i was i was in the middle of like uh finishing uh comments on two papers and i had a thesis to write and i had to write a post design a poster for a conference and i was literally just melting down i was like i can't remember my own name let alone a <laughs> 10 minute talk <laughs> um but it's really exciting and i think i wanted to do it because it was a challenge um so i'd highly recommend putting yourself out of your comfort zone and pushing yourself. Cause I learned a lot as well in that process. If people are curious, how, how did you get involved in doing that? So the, uh, the open university were organizing um, this, this TEDx series 
and they asked for people to apply to, to be involved and you didn't have to be at the Open University, you could be anywhere. So that was really interesting to know because that means there's likely lots of other TEDx uh, events going on. You don't have to necessarily be there to apply to be on it. And the theme was, um, I think like imagination and kind of like looking ahead. So I was like, great, ISRU, living on the moon, that's definitely kind of it. But I only decided this on the afternoon of the deadline and I threw a three minute video together <laughs> panically. I thought, oh, go on, I'll give it a go. And then I was like, oh, okay, no, I have to do this now. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure that'll make all the failed applicants feel really good about themselves as well. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't say that. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted to ask, um, you know, you're in a, quite a unique position now. We don't normally get guests who are fresh from their Viva. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of the highlights from your PhD for you? You know, some of the best opportunities that you've gotten involved with, other than the TED Talk, of course. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it was definitely um, a highlight was the graduate internship at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. So I know a number of people have been involved um, that you've had on the on the cast before. Um, and Sam Bell, who was actually on uh, there the year that I was there in 2018, um, which was it was just it was just such an awesome time. Um, I remember like day two or day three, they took us into the Apollo vault to see the samples and we were just like kids in a candy store what what is our life I think we've peaked um, and then we had to do some work um, but it was really exciting because you felt like you were working on well we were we were working on questions that were facing the NASA science community at the time um, so I've mentioned like these polar regions um, and these these permanent shadows and a lot of people have been concerned that um, the regolith within those shadows is really soft and that we would um, rovers would sink if they uh, if they were to go in there which would be disastrous if we we're exploring rovers so there was a lot of um, apprehension about sending anything into a shadowed region and so we looked at boulder tracks like images of boulders that had rolled down craters of the moon for whatever reason perhaps moon quakes or had like shaken them off the side um, and leaving these boulder tracks and we could actually measure those boulders and the tracks and figure out how strong the soil is by measuring um, bearing capacity and uh, we had this absolute wizard in our team who could process images of, of the moon like the shadowed regions and if there was just enough sunlight bouncing off the other crater wall like you could um, process the images and see inside the, the shadows so we were able to measure the strength of the soil in shadowed regions of the moon. Um, and we we're like, this is madness. Um, and it turns out the soil wasn't that weak. It was actually relatively strong compared to what you might expect. So this has been really promising for rover engineers. Um, so they're a bit more inclined to, to kind of go in there. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a, an absolute highlight for me. Amazing. Well, we can definitely put some details um, about the internship in the episode mm -hmm. description um, and I believe you guys have put together um, an LPSC abstract about it or was it a paper on that work? Um, so that work um, yeah so um, there was two the other team because we had two teams um, so in our team working on these boulder tracks we had um, a couple of papers um, so the one I was author, uh, lead author on was the uh, the shadowed region boulder track paper and that was this year so free to read also because at the Open University, everything we make has to be open access, which is great. So everyone can read it. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, well, we'll put those in the episode description if people want to look up some more information. Um, but yeah, wow, well, we've covered a lot of ground today um, and that was really great. Uh, but we do have one final question for you, Hannah. Um, it's that if you could be doing something completely different, either in academia or outside of academia, what would you want to do? Um, I would like to run a beach hut in Hawaii. This has been my go-to for a very long time because I'm a very stressy person. So <laughs> I just, and I love the sea. So I think that is my, my alternative career plan. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Um, yeah. Have you been to Hawaii before? Nope. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. All the more reason. But the, pic yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. the pictures look great. Just do it. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, it seems a, a reliable go-to. To just escape to. that sounds great um amazing well um thanks hannah for joining us today it's been really good to chat to you 
And thanks to all the listeners at home for tuning in for this episode. Um, if you'd like some more Earth and Planetary Science content, all of our links will be in the episode description and in the video thumbnail now. Um, but yes, thanks everyone and see you next week. Bye.